Hey guys, welcome back for our May 20th video lecture. Today we are going to be talking about President Barack Obama. Let's get right into it. So, believing in change, the election of 2008 pitted a young Democratic senator from Illinois, Barack Obama, against a much more experienced senator from Arizona, John McCain. Obama called for change. He criticized President Bush's tax cut policies and his pursuit of the war in Iraq. Obama's campaign slogan, Yes We Can, inspired Americans with aspirations for a greater country. So change we deserve. In 2008, in the midst of the election campaign, Barack Obama would release a book. The book laid out the candidate's plan for restoring the economy and America's leadership position in the world. In it, this is what he said. This is just a small excerpt. We stand at a moment of great challenge and great opportunity. All across America, a chorus of voices is swelling in a demand for change. The American people want the simple things that for eight years Washington hasn't delivered. An economy that honors the efforts of those who work hard. A national security policy that rallies the world to meet our shared threats and makes America safer. A politics that focuses on bringing people together across party lines to work for the common good. It is not too much to ask for. It is the change that American people deserve. Again, this is uh, from his book, Change We Can Believe In, published in 2008. So the nation's first African-American president. Uh, it's amazing to think that African-Americans have been in this country for as long as anyone, and yet uh, they had not seen an executive up until number 44, Barack Obama. Voters responded favorably to Obama's ideas. He won the presidency with 365 electoral votes to McCain's 173. It was a, it was a landslide. It was a great moment, uh, not only for the Democratic Party, but for African Americans all around the country, and for all Americans all around the country. This landslide victory gave Obama a mandate to pursue his plan for moving the country in a new direction. Remember, as well, late in President Bush's second term, Democrats took control of the House and the Senate. So President Obama is going to be coming in to a very, very powerful seat uh, as a Democratic president. The Bush economy dooms McCain. Uh, polls conducted before and after the election made it clear that the economy was the most important issue on the minds of voters. John McCain would have been a fine president. Anyone running on the Republican ticket that year would have faced tremendous political challenges. John McCain was, was close to President Bush, and many voters simply wanted a change from Bush policies. A lot of voters were, were very, very upset with what had gone on the previous eight years. And Barack Obama, with his campaign slogans of yes, we can, and hope, and change, it, it made him wildly, wildly popular uh, to voters all around the country. M McCain, again, would have been a fine president and, and was a fantastic man, a great man. Uh, but the timing for President McCain uh, simply wasn't there in 2008. So stimulus is an option. How are we going to get the economy back on its feet? Well, soon after his election, Obama began working with Democratic leaders of Congress on ways to bring about an economic recovery. One result was an economic stimulus package. A stimulus is an attempt by the government to inject money into the economy to encourage growth. With a vote that was overwhelmingly along party lines uh, and supported by only a few Republican lawmakers, the Democrats pushed the package through Congress. Saving the auto industry. The final bill passed in February 2009 contained $787 billion in spending and tax cuts. It included money for public works projects and tax credits for middle class families. In March, Obama announced a second auto bailout to prevent the auto industry from collapsing. The government provided some $60 billion in aid to General Motors and Chrysler. Our auto industry today 
would likely not exist without President Barack Obama. Uh, the city of Detroit would look very, very different today if not for President Barack Obama. The economy finds its footing. By the end of Barack Obama's presidency, his administration had added a total of 11.3 million jobs to the U.S. economy. The unemployment rate had stabilized just below 6% for the last three years of his presidency. The job market also saw an increase in the number of Americans doing part-time work or so-called gig jobs, like driving for ride-sharing services. And you can see uh, with our graph here, under President Bush, you know, almost like a runaway train, right? The unemployment begins to spike. It's halted early on uh, in President Obama's presidency, and then it's brought back down towards a, a more normal situation. So the ACA or Obamacare. In September of 2009, President Obama outlined his plan for overhauling the nation's health care system, something President Clinton tried to do in the 90s. Some 40 to 50 million Americans had no health insurance at the time. Most others worried about the steadily rising cost of health care. Obama's plan sought to lower health care costs, secure and stabilize health care for those who already had health insurance, and expand coverage to the millions of Americans who had no coverage whatsoever. A key element of Obama's plan was the individual mandate, a requirement that all Americans must buy health insurance. This part of the ACA is going to be heavily debated and is still questioned to this day. So the ACA becomes law. The president urged Congress, where Democrats held a majority in both houses, to work out the details together in a bipartisan way. That did not happen. Democrats made a few compromises to try to fashion a bill acceptable to Republicans who disagreed with the president's approach. But in the end, the Affordable Care Act passed with only a single Republican vote in favor of it. That's how overwhelming uh, the majorities were for the Democrats in both chambers of Congress. On March 23, 2010, Obama signed the bill into law. The ACA and the Supreme Court. Republicans called the reform law a government takeover of health care. They claimed that it's estimated three, not rather $930 billion uh, in cost over 10 years was too high and that it would add to budget deficits. Referring to the law as Obamacare, they vowed to repeal it. In 2015, the Supreme Court ruled in a 6-3 decision that tax credits available to those who were enrolled in either federal or state health insurance marketplaces was constitutional. This ruling meant that the Affordable Care Act would continue to function as President Obama intended, but debate about and attempts to repeal the law would continue for years, and it still continues to this day. The Tea Party and a sign of things to come. One of the groups that harshly criticized the Affordable Care Act was a new force on the political scene called the Tea Party. Taking its namesake from the Boston Tea Party of 1773, the group had no official leaders. It was a conservative populist protest movement that arose in reaction to what it saw as too much government involvement in the economy. Republicans move to the far right. The Tea Party never became an organized separate political party, but it enjoyed a significant political influence within the Republican Party. In January 2015, nine members of the House formed what would become known as the Freedom Caucus. Many more Republican members in the House have joined over time. One of the group's main goals is to move Republicans in Congress towards a more conservative view on fiscal and social issues. Many in the caucus have ties to the original Tea Party movement. So Obama focuses on bin Laden. The Taliban, aided by advisors from al-Qaeda, resurfaced in Afghanistan and were able to take back territory that they had lost earlier. In late 2009, Obama sent 33,000 U.S. troops to help NATO forces and the Afghan army thwart the Taliban assaults. Meanwhile, the U.S. military also launched a successful campaign of drone attacks against al-Qaeda. These attacks killed a number of al-Qaeda officials in Pakistan, causing the Pakistani government to protest that the U.S. strikes were violating their sovereignty. 
but they would have more to get upset about. Osama bin Laden is brought to justice. Uh, the monstrous individual that committed the heinous acts of September 11th would finally face justice in May of 2011 when a U.S. assault force on the ground finally located and killed Osama bin Laden in Pakistan. With bin Laden dead and the Taliban apparently in retreat, Obama decided to begin reducing the number of U.S. soldiers in the region. However, some military leaders believe that the forces would have to stay beyond the president's mark of 2014 to ensure that the Taliban would not regain control of Afghanistan. So the Supreme Court comes into focus yet again. Uh, throughout history, the Supreme Court rulings have often led to vigorous division and debate in the United States. In early 2016, however, it was not a Supreme Court ruling that would politically divide Republicans and Democrats, but the very composition of the court itself. Something happened in 2016 that really caught the nation off guard. On February 13th, Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia died unexpectedly while on vacation. President Reagan had a appointed Scalia, who was perhaps the court's leading conservative. His death created an opening on the court with under a year remaining in Barack Obama's presidency. According to the Constitution, the president has the authority to nominate candidates for the Supreme Court, but the Senate is responsible for meeting with nominees, debating their qualifications, and confirming them as Supreme Court justices. Well, the Senate at this time was controlled by Republicans. So Obama's nomination uh, for Merrick Garland didn't go anywhere. Uh, to fill the vacancy, President Obama nominated Merrick Garland, a judge in the U.S. Court of Appeals. Garland was respected by both Democrats and Republicans and considered to be qualified to serve as a justice on the Supreme Court. However, Republican, Republicans controlled the Senate and they had hoped that a Republican candidate would win the presidency later that year. With the ability to select a nominee for the Supreme Court, also now up for grabs, along with control of the White House, Republican leaders saw this as a chance for a major political opportunity. It's hard to argue that they didn't play it just right. Mitch McConnell stalls nomination. Mitch McConnell, in the Senate, as the Senate Majority Leader, announced that Republicans believe the next president should be the one to nominate the candidate and fill Scalia's position. Therefore, the Senate would not take any formal action on Merrick Garland's status as a Supreme Court nominee. Democratic lawmakers were outraged, and President Obama was also frustrated by the partisan nature of the Senate's decision. In the end, the Republican decision to use this delay action was a successful tactic. The next president would indeed be the one to nominate the next person to serve on the Supreme Court. All right, so that wraps up our lecture on President Barack Obama. Tomorrow, we will finish with current President Donald Trump. Have a wonderful day.